so much. Uh, I also really enjoyed the music. Thank you. It was beautiful. Um, and thank you also, Tom and Lorcan. It's been um, such a pleasure to hear your poems and share the stage with you. Um, it's conquer season now, so this poem feels appropriate. Sometimes I think of the conkers I gathered once when small myself, shucked of their green armour and placed in the glass bowl with the silvered rim to admire their mahogany sheen. Why am I driving the train off the rails? Two nights ago, my son woke at four in the morning, crying for me in the dark. I placed my cool hand on his forehead, licked with winter clamminess. He said, I had a bad dream. Softly, eyes tight shut, like something heard in a story. To my knowledge, his first, a concept I thought he hadn't yet met in his slender frame of human experience. The CD spinning leisurely in the neighbour's ruined magnolia glints its ambit of tapering sun. As I kissed his hair, I had a vision of his little head as a nut or hollow shell. A day or so later, the conkers issued a plague of white, wriggling worms from their seemingly impermeable, glossy surfaces. Next morning, over rice pops, I asked him what he had dreamed. I listened like a mother in a story, like listening could make it right. Um, my children have actually been collecting conkers recently, and my daughter brought one in and put it on the mantelpiece, and I quietly um, threw it out into the flower bed. <laughs> instant from my own childhood. Um, my mum is a bit of a hoarder, which I've learned in recent years is um, a particular trait uh, that often people who've had displacements or migrations um, bring with them into their new lives. Um, it means it's practically impossible to find anything in my parents' house, but sometimes treasures do emerge. Um, like this calendar that she dragged out of the attic one day, um, which turned out to be from 1983, the year of my birth. Um, and I was sort of flicking through this thing, which she seemed to think was more or less unremarkable, but I thought was some sort of relic, um, and found a highlighted date um, late on in the year, in the autumn, um, which I worked out must have been my due date that she'd highlighted. Um, when I wrote this poem, I was pregnant with my daughter, and I found myself thinking about um, the passage of time and myself, um, as I must have been forming in my mum's womb <laughs> through 1983 and the months um, of this picture calendar of Hong Kong. Um, and I think there's a sort of glossy technicolour falsity to the imagery in this poem that comes from that calendar, which seems like such an apt image of how um, place changes in the minds of people who are, have left it. Um, and I think there's something a bit apocalyptic about this too, that flicking through that calendar, so many of the monuments in it and landmarks had been demolished. Um, and I think there are lots of poems in this book that are sort of elegies for Hong Kong. Um, as a place that's now locking up its journalists as of well this week. Calendar. Unearthed in a clear out, a picture calendar she's kept, hoarding, I've learnt, is a mark of the emigrant across continents and time. Beautiful Hong Kong 1983 reads the cover's winking skyline, not quite idiomatically. The comb-bound pages, flip sides mottled, stick. Each month a panoramic vista shot from up the peak or other island spots. Full colour photography, faded now, the silk wallpaper chinoiserie. How quaint it seems, my birth year, or how colonial. 
birthday of Her Majesty, six days from Tuen Ung Festival. In January's foreground, an orange-tiled pagoda pops from a scrubby mountainside above the skyscrapers. Their bar chart ranks washed out against the harbour's blue, where a haze of rain turns down the contrast on Kowloon. A sense that something's off, then suddenly it dawns. The tallest of the needles pin through the coast are gone, or rather, not yet there. The time travel, uncanny, like spotting the twin towers intact in an 80s movie. I picture it, the waterfront, a juddering time lapse, where buildings fall and rise like the Hansang Index, cocooned in a greenish shroud of scaffolded bamboo to emerge at cloud level, gleaming and improbable. The sky's bright hemline creeping ever higher, while junks skim like fiery leaves across a pond's mirror. Count back nine fingers. February, the month that I sparked into being a world of cells. In the print, fireworks like red anemones cast their glow over starlit water. Office box, ghostly from the long exposure. March, the green peak tram chugs up a jungled incline I have eyelids now, still fused, a crescent moon of spine. I flip ahead to June, which frames the exact aspect from the windows of our family's long gone flat. Once you've left, home turns into something foreign. My kicks are butterflies, my length a handspan. August, dusk. And the city's purpled high rises disappear beneath a glaze of sky in Flammy Rose. Only to invent themselves in only to reinvent themselves in blinking neon as traffic streaks the streets with white hot ribbons. By the last trimester, each puffing steps a strain. The truth is, you can't ever quite come home again. On October's spread, an orphaned clock tower in reddish brick, marooned on a demolished shore. Note how the 14th has been highlighted in yellow. She did mention that I was two weeks overdue. December, a tire-skirted ferry edges towards dock, caught in its endless crossing, back and forth, forth and back. Um, I find myself stuck in a bit of a half rhyme loop at the moment. I really like the sort of mix of um, pleasure and sad disappointment <laughs> you get with half rhyme couplets. Um, a bit like those very sour sweets, you know. Um, uh, you'll need something from this is from a sequence that I wrote for a really lovely museum in Liverpool called the World Museum. Um, and I'd wanted for a long time to write something about Chinese ceramics and porcelain, which always struck me as sort of objects that I felt a kind of kinship with, you know, um, things that uh, um, come from one place and end up in another. And I, I think in, in writing the, the stories and the imagined journeys of these objects, um, it became a way of thinking about human migration and resilience too. Um, I was particularly taken um, on my visits to museums with these things called shipwreck porcelains. I don't know if you've ever seen them, but um, so much uh, porcelain was, was being um, shipped from, from east to west, but the ships sank periodically. And so you get these pristine collections in shipwrecks that are sometimes discovered of rows and rows of, of pots and bowls and whatever, um, still packed in their crates um, that have sunk to the bottom of the ocean for centuries. Um, and sometimes they fuse into these improbable <coughs> structures um, like barnacles, as if they were organic, like corals forming themselves. Um, that wasn't actually the case necessarily with this particular dish. 
though I invented this history for it, was <coughs> authorised by the fact that the museum in Liverpool was itself bombed in the Blitz. And so it has this um, a classical facade that when you enter the building, you realise it's just a facade because the rest of it was, was burnt out after the bomb fell. Um, and so it's an entirely modern um, steel construction behind. And so I found myself writing about all these things in imagining the history of this dish um, whose actual provenance um, details had been burnt in that fire. Thinly potted porcelain crack dish painted in underglaze blue. Is there a word for it in this new time? The class of ships the Portuguese named Caravella and the French Carac. Swift three or four masters, they were crack to the Dutch, whose guttural pitch I first heard from the sailors who loaded us up in our straw stuffed crates. Porcelain ware vessels of diverse sorts, the manifest called us, stowed by the hundreds of thousands. Wares named for those stately ocean going craft, sailing homeward from the mythic east, freighted with silk and damask, barrels of oakum, quicksilver, cinnabar, camphor. Till disaster struck, wrecked off Goa's golden coast. As the cold current of decades flowed past us, my stacked brethren crusted with barnacles and powdery salt, mouths filling up with silt. Still, some of us continued to gleam like the shells that yawned in those depths. Dredged up from the dark, they pieced my fragments back to wholeness, masked each crack with filler and skill. At last I came to rest in this museum, a heavy Victorian vitrine whose subtly distorting glass recalled for me light filtering through underwater weeds. That night in the Blitz was my last near escape. Nothing like the kiln's clarify, ca clarifying flames, that fire was something else. Ranks of precious artefacts blasted into tinder, their cases smashed, rare specimens reduced to scattered feathers, shards of wired bone. In the aquarium, fish boiled in their tanks or swilled down drains. The model fishing boats went up in smoke. I've seen what it takes to cradle a wreck back to the light. Leaving the fractures for all to see, they rebuilt this place. From the other side of ruin, we found safe passage. Um, I'll just read one more poem. Um, I'm so out of the habit of doing readings, my apologies. I left the house this morning and completely forgot to bring a tote bag of books that I usually <laughs> bought with me. So if there are no books, no, I'm sorry. But um, uh, I suppose there is a new one um, uh, due at some point late-ish next year. Um, I, th I feel hesitant about this poem still, but I think it must have a place in the book, really. Um, so much of which is thinking about how, when you have children yourself, you find yourself um, kind of revisiting your own parenting <laughs> and <laughs> maybe seeing new things in it. Um, we uh, moved back in with my parents in a multi-generational uh, living arrangement that I imagine must be increasingly common um, around the world, really. Uh, and ended up staying for two years um, after my son was born. And this poem comes out of that time and my poor, long-suffering parents. A history of my relationship with my mother in 23 arguments about the laundry. <laughs> in my parents' house, the second smallest room and my mother's every sixth waking thought is devoted to the laundry. 
Growing up, a pair of my jeans frayed at the heel, a favourite jumper would disappear for months, it seemed, having been sucked into the faintly mis musty mountains of colour-coded, fabric-sorted, care instruction heeded, but as yet undone, laundry. I started to wonder why, as a not exactly lazy teenager, I had never helped with the laundry. I started to wonder why there was always so much laundry. Until in my 34th year, I moved back into my parents' house, though not my childhood room, bringing one husband, one newborn, and an awful lot of laundry. I didn't understand then how laundry didn't mean in any normal sense just laundry. I started to find neat piles of folded pastel sleep suits pressed to perfection, or strung up in the airing cupboard on tiny hangers saved, it seems, since my own babyhood, boxed and shipped halfway across the world, and something tugged in my stomach that wasn't about laundry. In time, it became, Mummy, please don't do our laundry. I would find her, a staring, agitated zombie, coming down for breakfast at nearly lunch, and she told me that she couldn't sleep at night because she was waiting for the tumble dryer to finish its cycle at some point past three, and if she did not wait for its beep, 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 there's always a chance it would burst into hidden, arcing flames, smouldering from the compressed greyish fluff spun from all our mortal hair and laundry. It transpired that she had an unshakable belief in the need to load the drum no more than a quarter of the way, despite my protestations about killing the planet with laundry. Pushing the pram through the twilit park to let off steam, my husband would growl, she's crazy, it's not just the laundry. I sought to illustrate to her that putting more than one towel in at once would not result in disaster, flood, famine, or destruction of said laundry. As I said it, I recalled how friends at school had laughed at my pronunciation of that word, Tarwell, with two syllables, picked up from a non-native speaker mother whose finger pads were etched with brown cracks like drought-struck fields because of the sheer graft, I'm not a wife, I'm a slave, devoted to household work like the laundry. Eventually, the corner piles of socks and sheets and God knows what got too much and I spent a weekend with an eight-week-old and a forget-me-not sling at my chest, bending and lifting, bending and lifting my heavy, leaking body to cycle through load after load of fucking laundry. I worked my way down through ancient strata of crumpled clothing, socks stiffened as if in Everest permafrost, Trouser legs splayed like victims at Pompeii, recognising revenants, fashion hauntings, till I reached towards the bottom a school cricket cap, spattered with black spots and blotches my brother must have last worn shortly before puberty, which he tipped into the wicker basket and lost to the psychic trauma archaeology of laundry. In the eighth or ninth month, we went away for a week, desperate for space, and my mother shrank to teddy size a woolen shrug of mine slung from the back of the guest room door, putting it through a hot spin cycle because you said your clothes didn't need any special care, so I thought I'd help put it in the laundry. In more time, it became if she would stay out of ours, I would stay out of her laundry. I am still amazed by the soul's opacity towards itself as illustrated by her adventures in passive-aggressive laundry. Stood in front of the ancient Miele dryer one night, she told me that as a child of five or six, when her mother couldn't afford to look after her and she was farmed out to live with other families, the way she earned her keep was to be in charge. She gestured to a welt I'd never noticed on her wrist of their ironing, her small fist steering one of those old bronzed hollow ones loaded up with orange coals, a detail so absurd it almost made me laugh, and all the other, other families assorted laundry. Sometimes, glancing up from his paper at the hangers perched on every knob, their untenanted shirts, my dad used to say, this house looks like a Chinese laundry. If there is a god who flits about and pities such shop-worn, tumbled souls as ours, let it be the god of laundry. Now that I, Husband, child one, and now two, have our own home again, and she has hers. I think of her at night, still sitting at the morning room table, alone at 3.30, in the reading lamp's illuminated pool, flipping through the radio times with a beveled pink highlighter, waiting for the beep, 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 
too high-pitched for her ageing ears to hear that signals an end to the latest round of laundry.